Stories, fables, ghostly tales. When angels and demons lament over humanity with a sense of despair that can be all consuming, a mysterious black goo controls a town, a man who only ever wanted to watch things wriggle, a dog who's gone before you know it, and the meaning of life in a letter. Yes, today is listener stories, you awesome listeners, and a little creepy pasta story at the very end. <laughs> because, you know, I like to shake things up. Your authors and stories are Felicia Dearman with Humanity Part 1 and The Great Flag of the Dead, Tom Keithley with Humanity Part 2, Paris Michaels with I Like to Watch Them Wriggle, Quinn with the short tale My Dog Can Teleport, and Christopher Maxim bringing to you the creepy pasta I Discovered the Meaning of Life, a set of unique tales just for you. Two things I'd like to share with you today. I have a habit of attracting strange people in public places, and today I had one such experience. The long short of it is, I was sitting down at a train station, where an old lady came up to me and sat down. She then proceeded to look at me, then my phone, and asked me, whether 9gag was free on my phone, and how much it costs monthly or annually to use 9gag. I mentioned it was free, and then she repeated the question, and then she repeated it again, even though I told her it's free. Ah yes, <laughs> the people I meet. So I ended up saying, actually yeah, it's uh, $10 per month, you should check it out. <laughs> hey look, it worked, and she said thank you very much, and walked off. Ah yeah, good times. The second thing that's strange is, I'm having a new tea. Well, I mean that's not strange, but the kind of tea is. It's an apple, cinnamon, and turmeric combo. Delicious. So, grab your own hot beverage, turn off the lights, and let's listen to something different. Humanity, Part A, by Felicia Dearman, The Brooding of an Angel. Humanity, such an innocent thought. Who could have known how easy it would be to twist and contort said humanity into a truly evil world? The light from the souls of humans slowly fading as every human loses their humanity. I've watched humanity from the beginning, and I helped create the beginnings of said humanity. I suppose I'll be watching the ending of it soon. Their world, slowly decaying and rotting away, just like their souls. Overcame with greed and pride, their souls covered in the blackest ash-like substance I'd ever seen. They plead to us to help them, as they continue to kill their planet and each other. The ones who praise us yet continue to do wrong. That is humanity. I'm watching my creations destroy each other. The world I loved so much. Covered by demonic-like humans. But yet the idea of humanity used to be so innocent. Sinless by heart. Truthful by soul. That is what some people believe in the corrupt, decaying world. The disappointing part is... They don't truthfully believe it. They praise but continue to sin behind closed doors, like cowards. Just a mask covering their ugliness. There's never been a perfect human. Clearly our plans were flawed from the beginning. The minute Adam took that apple is when I should have given up. I thought I could save humanity if I could just find a single non-corrupt soul that is still shining light. But there are no more. No souls with any experience in life has light. Humanity is over. For the next twenty or so years, the world will continue to decay and rot, all while the humanity we work so hard for is lost. Well, you humans keep praying to your gods to fix the world. 
you are rotting inside out. I, on the other hand, have a new world to create. Part B. The Chaos Perspective by Tom Keithley No one has ever really asked me who or how. No, most of these mutated monkeys never take the time to ask me those kind of questions. They aren't about themselves, so they have little interest. No, instead all they ask is, why? Usually followed up by, for the love of God, or all that is good, holy, why? Or some such drivel. Religion. Pfft. They will never truly understand the full nature of the universe. Of reality. But they try. Oh, how they try. And they get it wrong every time. But they keep trying. Monkeys and typewriters, right? Though when you really think about it, when it comes to a monkey using a typewriter, at least the best case scenario is that it produces some incomprehensible drivel that does no one any immediate harm. While worst case, they take the typewriter and proceed to beat other monkeys to death with it, shrieking and flinging feces the entire time. Humans, and yes, I use the term very condescendingly, are those monkeys. I mean, come on. But I digress. Apologies. Where was I? Oh, right. I guess the best way to start is by answering the who question. I am the kitsch, a demon. Now, now, don't panic. Sheesh. I've met howler monkeys that were less skittish. That's better. So yes, I am a demon right out of hell. Yes, that hell. But I'm not just any demon, you see. I am one of the first. Yes, I was once an angel, and I fell with Lucifer himself so long ago, and you, my little simian kith, are not your average primate, no. You are to be mine in every conceivable way, it's what you were born to be. And through your flesh, I will weave a tapestry of destruction and tragedy that the stars themselves shall weep over for eons. It's what we were both created to do. Has your life not felt vapid, pointless, and bereft of any true meaning? As though you were meant for something beyond all comprehension, but it was somehow beyond you to get there. Well, now that I'm here, all that can go away, for today is your true birthday. Today, your meaningless existence ceases and your true destiny begins. What do you mean, no? Oh, you think you have a choice? That's so cute. Time and tide wait for no man, you pathetic knockoff Armani. Your compliance is not a factor. You've done your job and kept my suit nice and warm, relatively safe. Can't help but notice a few scars and healed fractures here and there. Clumsy fool. But now, you can just sit back and enjoy the show. Because your part in this story just got diminished greatly. I would end your existence, but I think once you get a taste of what we truly are, that you will much rather stick around than find out what awaits you down there. The scary basement trope exists for a reason, you know. And yes, following that theme, the attic is every bit as scary. So, besides, you do rather amuse me. As far as your species go, you're rather brave, but not to the point of stupidity, and your curious mind intrigues me. So for now at least, I'll let you ride shotgun. Besides, not like I'm going to have a lot of friends to have any meaningful discourse with. That being said, let's get this apocalypse started. <laughs> The Great Flag of the Dead by Felicia Dearman The pounding of the rain on the tin roof wakes me up. My heartbeat feels like it meets the rhythm of the rain. I wipe my forehead, which is for some reason covered in sweat. Gazing around my room, I notice my phone lighting up. 
I read the notification saying there had been a large volcanic eruption 450 miles away. I tilt my head, thinking this has to be a joke. The time on my phone says almost noon. I shake my head trying to make sense of this. Did the eruption really turn it dark over here? I put on my coat as I open the door. It being dark and all, I don't want anything falling on my bare skin. I walk down a flight of stairs and reach my apartment building doors. The hat my doorman, Philip, is usually wearing is laying upside down in a pile of broken glass I had only just noticed. I chew on the inside of my cheek, a horrible, nervous tick, as I stick my head out the doors. I hesitate slightly, but continue down the sidewalk against my better judgment. I come to a group of people surrounding something on the ground. At least six people grunting as they circle whatever it is that has them so interested. One man that looks like he has eaten too many grandma's cookies looks up. His face stained red as he unveils what they were surrounding. Philip laid there with no limbs and his head cracked open. A dark haired and dark skinned female looks up revealing Philip's intestines in her mouth. I gasp in horror as Philip's eyes pop open completely encased with black goo. It slowly covers his entire face as he screams in agony. My legs have been frozen for too long, and I know it. The scream distracted the group of whatever those were, long enough for me to dart back into my apartment building and lock the door, hyperventilating heavily as my eyes flutter closed, leaning against the wall where I stay for multiple hours unsure what to do. What was that black stuff? What were those people doing? I pull out my bong to medicate since I can't stop shaking. I still only hear rain on the roof but I think it might be the sounds of ash and burning things falling instead. I cough softly <coughs> as I exhale and lean back once again. Maybe this is all I should do. You know, get stoned and wait for the inevitable. That comment pissed off a part of myself, the part screaming at me that I need to fight. I get aggravated with myself and look out of my curtain. There are now hundreds of people walking around mindlessly towards one direction. Some of their faces encased with the black goo, some of them just covered in blood. I see a co-worker of mine and turn away closing the curtain. I turn on the TV trying to see if there are any news alerts. I stare in horror as they show New York being quarantined for a terrorist attack. The little boy U-235 bomb equivalent of 12.5 kilotons of TNT has been dropped on the Statue of Liberty, with a nerve agent that was dropped on all of New York. A black powder substance can be seen being sprayed out of multiple aircrafts. It has been confirmed that the highest levels of the White House were behind the attack. I flip off the TV quickly, too real for my taste as I take another rip from my bong. The information I just heard swarming in my head as my phone vibrates, indicating a text. It's my boyfriend who lives a few blocks away. The text reads, Hey, where are you? I chew on my cheek thinking how strange it was that he didn't ask if I was okay. I open my curtain right by my couch that I had somehow sat down on. There. In the middle of hundreds of mindless walkers, I see my boyfriend. He has his phone out, looking around, sniffing the air. A chill runs down my spine as he makes eye contact with me. My phone vibrating causes me to jump and drop it. I pick it up, reading the text that says, I see you. I'm coming to you. Don't run. You can't hide. You can't escape. We are all. I look back out my window, quickly to see the hundreds of mindless wanderers now running full speed at my apartment building. I gasp quietly as I do the only thing I know to do. I grab my katana off the case above my TV. 
I've never used it on people, but I have been teaching myself moves with YouTube for attackers. The door bursts open, followed by silence. I'm ready to fight and die fighting. I get a hand over my mouth and I'm quickly pulled into another room where the person locks the door. I wave my katana at him as my eyes adjust from the sunlight, which at this point is breaking through the west coast. I see a bearded man about 6'2", in his early 30s, wearing a blood-soaked shirt. I gulp as I raise my weapon higher, wondering if he is also a trick. He clears his throat quietly, <clears throat> in an amusing manner, as if only to indicate offense. I whisper yell, Who the hell are you? He smirks and whispers back, I'm Agent McGovern, and I'm here to help. Already looking forward to part two of The Great Dead Flag by Felicia Dearman. But that concludes this story for now. And for our next story, I like to watch them wriggle. My son has sleep paralysis, I think. My son is 14 and lies in bed paralyzed, eyes open, and I can see the terror in them. He looks around the room frantically only with his eyes. I try to shake him, but nothing ever happens. I feel scared for my child, but also for myself. We live alone, and there is no way to determine what he's seeing or going through when this happens. I need to back up. It started a month ago. Me and Aiden had moved from the west coast back down to the south. We are living in Arkansas now. It was too hard living in such an expensive economy on my wages. So I came back home. Anyway, I rented up this three bedroom house in the historical district in Van Buren. We weren't far from the historical graveyard. I knew this was going to be a great change financially. Aiden was in a smaller school and quickly made friends. Within the first week, he was blooming and happy. I was happy. I got to see my family and continue working as a journalist. While I made less wages, the economy was far less expensive. We felt rich. We could do things and buy things that were never possible in California. Sorry, I rambled on there for a second. Our second week back was still going great. I was handed an assignment to cover for the Times record. It was about a man who had been on death row for 15 years and was to be executed near Little Rock, closer to Tennessee, but that is just details. I didn't particularly care for the assignment, but it was my job. My mum was going to keep Aiden while I made my travel down there. It was a boring drive and I stayed lost in my thoughts about how to approach this assignment. The man that was getting the lethal injection had murdered three kids aged 7 to 10. He had been found guilty, put on death row, and people slowly forgot about him until now. His name was John Aggie. John Aggie had been found guilty of mutilating the three young boys. After he had killed them by covering their small heads with plastic bags, he had told the court that he loved to watch them wriggle. It made him feel powerful. After further investigations, they found that he was a current client in an outpatient program for people with mental health issues. The jury found him guilty and they threw away the key. The next night, he was to be executed at midnight. I managed to get in the room as a spectator. I felt like I was going to puke. They asked John Aggie if he had any last words. He did. I don't know why you're killing me. I just, I just like to watch them wriggle. That was it. That was all he had to say. They injected him with the three poisons, and he was gone. I overheard that he was to be buried in the graveyard by my house. A family plot. I went to the bathroom and puked. I wrote the piece for the paper, and it was done. I tried to put John Aggie out of my mind. It was hard when a few days later, I saw them covering his burial plot. I didn't tell Aiden. He didn't need to know. Of course, he found out at school anyway. The junior high was buzzing with the fact that John Aggie was buried right in our town. 
and Aiden's friends chided on about how he was so close to our home. The sleep paralysis started beginning at midnight. Aiden would wake but was unable to move for an hour or so and he wouldn't tell me about it the next day. After a couple of these episodes, I took him to see the doctor. They diagnosed him with sleep paralysis, said there was nothing to be done, and he would probably grow out of it. Things continued on like this into our third week of being in Arkansas. The sleep paralysis didn't let up. It happened nightly. Then it started carrying over into the morning. I was completely freaked out and scared, like I said, and Aiden was exhausted. He managed to pull out of these fits around 7am every morning. I would send him to school and he would come home and nap. Well, when I started typing this, he had just come out of a sleep paralysis. This time was different though. John Aggie's face was intertwined with Aiden's. He said, I just like to watch them wriggle. I'm not sure what to make of this. Aiden is at school and I did a small investigation on Aggie. He had been diagnosed with autism. He was on the lower end of the spectrum. He was also an avid fisherman. I found a photo of him holding up a wriggling worm, and there was another man in the picture. His brother, James. John Aggie looked harmless enough, but his brother? My god, his brother. He had cold, dead eyes and no smile. Beside him was a little boy, his son, Mark. Mark was one of the children killed. I looked deeper into the case, and at one point, John Aggie had broken down when they began questioning him about Mark. All John Aggie could get out was, I'll like to watch them wriggle. I can't prove it, but I think John Aggie needs someone to know that he did not kill those kids. His brother did. And what he liked to watch wriggle were his fishing worms. I know he won't leave my Aiden alone until I prove his innocence. My Dog Can Teleport by Quinn I know it sounds like a hoax, but I have multiple witness accounts confirming my story. My dog's full name is Alastrina Blueberry. Alastri owner in Scottish means man's defender. The name was too hard to pronounce, so we just call her Alice. My dad named her that because he wanted a guard dog, so he bought a Mastiff Rottweiler mixed breed. It was mostly Mastiff though, so it didn't look very intimidating. Her bark, however, is very much so. Unfortunately, Alice loves escaping. She knows where home is and will return, but my sister spoils Alice by bribing her with meat just to make sure she comes back. So whenever she's given the chance, she will bolt, so she can get rewarded for coming home. One day she got out and we couldn't find her. An hour after we stopped looking, she came back with a limp. Her back right leg was hurt. She must have fallen in a pothole or got hit by a car. As days passed, soon her back left leg was hurting too. She was putting too much weight on her back legs. Because of this, she's almost always lying down. We give her meds, but only if she starts feeling too much pain. The first time I witnessed Alice's ability, I was on the edge of my balcony looking over our family room. Alice was just lying there in her usual spot, in the center of the floor instead of her $40 bed. She turned to look at me with her black eyes. I turned towards the playroom to start walking inside when I heard something. I turned back to the now empty family room. Surprised by Alice's sudden disappearance, I turned back to the playroom to see her standing in the entrance. There are only two ways to get upstairs, up the wooden stairs to my right and the winding carpet stairs in the playroom. Alice did the whole thing in a matter of three seconds. She couldn't have taken the wood stairs. I would have heard her go up the stairs and she would have to pass me to get to the playroom. However, the playroom stairs were further away and, with Alice's hurt legs, it would have taken her at least five seconds to get up there. And in saying that, for her to have gotten there in the first place, 
she would have to get off the ground, run to the carpet stairs, run up the stairs, and stand in the entryway perfectly silent and without being out of breath. Things just keep getting stranger and stranger. And I have more stories about Alice and how she teleports, but I'll need some more time to gather the information, just to make sure it's accurate. Stay with me though, and thanks for listening to my experience. Many stories to come. I Discovered the Meaning of Life by Christopher Maxim So, I discovered the meaning of life, or at least that's what my eager customers are led to believe. You see, two or three times a month I post a listing titled The Meaning of Life to various auction sites. I coupled it with a sappy picture of a sunset or rainbow and a description that reads all views are subjective. Results may vary. Most people wouldn't bat an eye at such a ridiculous listing, but there are some gullible folks out there that take the bait. When the bidding ends, I usually take home anywhere from $5 to $12. After I've received my money via PayPal, I ship out the item. What is the item, you might ask? Well, I scribble down an inspirational quote or life lesson onto a piece of paper and mail it out in your standard letter-sized envelope. The quotes are usually from famous writers, historical figures, or the Bible. Some of them include, If light is your heart, you'll find your way home. Quoted by Rumi, People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Quoted from Maya Angelou, it's never too late to be what you might have been. Quoted from George Eliot. And that's it. One stamp, a drop in the mailbox, and my work is done. It's as simple as that. You might call me a scammer or a con artist, or perhaps even a plagiarist. And in truth, you are correct. I'm taking advantage of the naive people out there who are probably just looking for a sense of purpose in life. All so I can make a quick buck. But I like to think most people know it's bullshit and purchase my listing just to see what I send them. Besides, I'm a bachelor right out of college. So long as I can make a small dent in my phone bill and eat a packet of ramen each night, I'll sleep just fine. As you might imagine, I received quite a bit of hate mail. I've learned to ignore angry emails and private messages on the auction sites. As soon as I see that it's from one of my customers, it gets deleted. I do. However, receive the occasional snail mail. It's unavoidable, as my P.O. box is listed on all of the envelopes I send out. It would be pretty easy for me to toss these letters into the trash with the rest of my junk mail, but I never can. Something about receiving a physical letter from someone, good or bad, compels me to read it. I feel that anyone who takes the time to write one deserves to have their voice heard even if I don't really care for what they have to say. The more physical letters I receive, the more amused I am by them. To paint a better picture, here are a few of my favorite quotes from the fan mail I've received over the years. You're nothing but a glorified fortune cookie service. You'll rot in hell for the sins you've committed. Mark my words. You're a real fucking piece of shit. You know that? It's reached a point where reading these letters has become the highlight of my week. I've even tacked up some of the better ones on a corkboard in my bedroom. You might think that's sick and a little messed up, but I think it's hilarious. Not all of the letters I received are bad. There's one guy by the name of Red, no last name, that's all he ever writes above his return address, who mails me constantly. He sends me inspirational quotes in exchange for mine. I assume he is a repeat buyer who enjoys paying for and receiving cheerful messages in his mailbox every now and again. A man of class and dignity, my kind of customer. The first quote Red ever sent me was, The fear of death follows from the fear of life. A man who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. From Mark Twain. This was a great first impression, as Mark Twain is one of my favorite authors. 
The return quote was much appreciated. As such, I hung it up next to the hate mail on my corkboard. Some of the things Red sends me, however, are not corkboard material. Some of the quotes he sends are morbid and depressing. And other times, he'll mail me small packages containing little trinkets that I have no use for. It's a little weird, but I figure the guy is depressed and just needs a friend. Maybe the quotes he buys from me is the only thing he has to look forward to each morning. Perhaps the things he sends me are his way of saying thanks. To me, it's validation that what I'm doing isn't completely sleazy. But here's where things get weird. Today, I received another envelope from Red. I smiled when I pulled it out of my P.O. box. His letters and gifts, no matter how odd, were just as much, if not more of a highlight to my week than the endless entertaining hate mail. Upon opening the envelope, however, my smile vanished. Inside was a photograph of me taken up close through my bedroom window. On the back of the photograph was another one of Red's quotes. You look so alone. Where's the meaning in your life? Well, I hope you enjoyed the stories. A huge thank you to all you lovely listeners and the listener submissions that have been coming through. I've been getting stories, recommendations, it's been fantastic. I really appreciate it. And a shout out to a couple of special listeners who were either constantly chatting to me via email, saying hi, or providing me suggestions. We have Matthew Bauer, Tom Keithley, Felicia Dearman, Bailey R., Dark Angel, Jessica Allen, Ashley Pendorf, Kai, Lita, Anna, Asma, McQuackens, Devontae, and Shandy. Also, a big thank you to Star Eve 2099 who not only listens, leaves comments on SoundCloud, but also gives me a heads up when I have a skip or repeat in my audio. I really appreciate that. A big high five to you, mate. I'll be doing a set of SoundCloud shoutouts this week and YouTube shoutouts as well. I have a lot to get through, and I think the conversion to the new Gmail format has been playing silly buggers with my emails. So bear with me as I try to catch up on my old emails, as they've messed up all the filters that I use to track people and who I've responded to. But I'll get there, trust me. But stick with me Wednesday, where I'm going to be doing some more Swedish folktales. And if I get a chance, I'll be trying to do some more mysterious stories or classic gothic tales. So as always, have a fantastic day or night, and I'll see you next time. time.